Okay, uh, Brett, just want to make sure you can hear us and we can hear you. Uh, I can hear you just fine. How do you hear me? Got you loud and clear. Uh, just at the outset, for anybody watching on Channel 2, I did want to point out the uh, farewell ceremony that's taking place right now for Secretary of the Air Force Deborah Lee James uh, occurring at Joint Base Andrews is being live streamed on a separate channel on defense.gov. Uh, you can watch it there. Uh, this is being carried in the building here on Channel 2 as well as also being streamed on a separate channel on defense.gov. Uh, I'd like to introduce uh, to you Colonel Brett Sylvia. He's the current commander of the 2nd Brigade Combat Team, 101st Airborne Division Task Force Strike, which is the roughly 1,700-person unit responsible for the advise and assist mission in Iraq. Task Force Strike advisory teams have successfully advised the Iraqi security forces through operations in Fallujah, Sherkat, Kayara, the occupation of Kayara West Airfield, and they're currently advising during operations to retake Mosul. Uh, I, I set that out for you because I want you to please, as you, uh, as you uh, engage in uh, discussion today with uh, Colonel Sylvia, to keep in mind that's what his role is. I know we have a lot of other good questions about things happening in, in uh, Syria, happening in the skies, happening with Russia and Turkey and other players. That's actually not his responsibility. So I will uh, uh, humbly ask your understanding of that uh, at the get-go. We're happy to field those questions for you separately, either here or, or with Colonel Dorian in Baghdad. Uh, Task Force Strike's role is critical in setting the conditions for the inevitable military de of defeat of Iraq, of, of ISIS in Iraq, excuse me. And with that, I'll open it up to you, Colonel Sylvia. Uh, good morning. Uh, so as stated, I'm Colonel Brett G. Sylvia, uh, the commander of uh, 2nd Brigade Combat Team, 101st Airborne Division, Air Assault. Here in Operation Inherent Resolve, uh, I am the commander of Task Force Strike. Uh, we are the one brigade combat team deployed forward here in Iraq. Our primary mission these past nine months have been to advise and assist the Iraqi and Kurdish security forces in the fight to defeat ISIL in Iraq. I'd like to make a brief statement about some of the tremendous accomplishments uh, we've achieved together since our arrival here in May, uh, and then open it up to your questions. So as Lieutenant General Townsend described last month, 2016 has been characterized by the counteroffensive. Over the course of this year, this task force found ways to deepen our involvement with our Iraqi counterparts. Their success has been our success, as we have been working very closely with one another. I've gotten many questions about what the advise and assist mission actually looks like on the ground. Uh, I'd like to give you a short vignette uh, to answer this particular question. We were recently visiting one of our forward advisory teams at their joint command post on the outskirts of Mosul. Captain Dan Fitzgerald and his team advised the commander of the Iraqi Emergency Response Division. When we arrived, they were in the middle of processing a strike. Inside this small command post, I saw Iraqi officers and coalition soldiers huddled around a very small monitor. The Iraqis were talking on their communication devices, and we were on ours. They had identified a threat with a coalition ISR platform, and together they were working a strike to eliminate that threat before it reached the friendly forces. The division commander walked in, verified the threat, and authorized the strike. The threat was immediately destroyed. Uh, that is our advise and assist mission in a nutshell. The Iraqis do the ground maneuver, and we support them with all the capabilities at our disposal. We work as one team to accomplish the mission. We employ this model at various echelons, from this company commander all the way to me and my three-star partner. This model, in my opinion, has gotten more effective over time and has yielded greater and greater success. Over the course of the past nine months, great things have been accomplished here in Iraq. It has been our partnership that has achieved these things. Hundreds of villages and cities have been liberated, to include Fallujah, Kiara, Sharkat, and Karakosh. Assistance has been provided to almost 250,000 displaced persons, and almost 100,000 of these departed their IDP camps and headed back to their homes. An assault bridge was put over the Tigris River under fire, and then three more bridges were constructed over the Tigris and the Khazar Rivers. A major airfield was liberated and then restored at Q West. 
and we have measurably reduced the effectiveness of ISIL's primary weapon system, the vehicle-borne IED, and we've assisted in the targeting of ISIL's drones, bringing down almost a dozen. We've done these things together. The Iraqis have been on the ground, and we have enabled them both with effective advice and timely assistance. This has been a partnership between these Iraqi formations and Task Force Strike. As I said, their success has been our success. We operate as one team. Before I close, I'd like to tell one story. On Christmas Day, I attended a service at the Marahana Church in Karakosh. It was the first Christmas service in this church in over two years. I sat in a pew next to the operational commanders currently fighting in Mosul. They represented each of the Iraqi security forces and all of whom are Muslim. The commander of the federal police who used his own funds to renovate the church to have it ready in time for Christmas mass pulled me aside just before the service and said that this was his Christmas gift to me and to my soldiers for our contributions leading to the liberation of this area. Since our arrival in Iraq, we assisted in the liberation of a patch of Iraq larger than the state of West Virginia. But this one event represented much more than the liberation of physical terrain. It was a symbol of the cooperation of all the Iraqi security forces, a symbol of the contrast between the tolerance of the real Iraqis and the intolerance of ISIL, and a symbol of optimism of what Iraq can be in the future. In closing, let me say that I'm extremely proud of every member of Task Force Strike and all they have accomplished these past nine months. We provided training, equipment, intelligence, fire support, and advice to our very capable Iraqi partners. Everywhere I go and talk with Iraqi leaders, they go out of their way to talk about their partner, a strike leader standing side by side with them, enabling them with coalition expertise and effects, compelling success, and defeating an enemy of all people everywhere. They have truly lived up to our brigade motto. I'm a strike soldier, I fight where I'm told, and I win where I fight. That's all I have for an opening statement. I'd be happy to take your questions at this time. We'll start with uh, Idris Ali from Reuters. Um, speaking about the capabilities of the ISF in general, um, where do you see some of the deficiencies that they need more work in? Because as we've seen in the operation to retake Mosul, um, other than the CT forces, there are some serious deficiencies and issues. So w what specifically do you think needs more work in terms of training and, and advising them? One of the things that, that we've had the great fortune of doing over the course of these last nine months is being able to witness a, a great transformation in the Iraqi security forces. Uh, when we first began these operations, uh, the first village that we liberated together was a small village. Uh, it was called uh, Karbadan. And uh, when they went to, to seize this particular village, uh, there was no more than you know, 30 to 40 ISIL fighters that existed in that village. And they sent an entire brigade uh, to attack that particular village uh, because that's what they felt uh, was the, the combat power that was required in order to be able to, to seize that village. But what we've witnessed now over time uh, since that day, uh, way back in May, is that they have uh, increased their ability to conduct combined arms maneuver. It has been a growing capability. I'm sure you all have heard the stories about Ramadi where uh, it was only the counterterrorism services uh, that were leading the fight and it was the Iraqi army that uh, had to move in uh, behind them. Uh, they were the only offensive maneuver. Uh, but today, uh, in Mosul, uh, what you'll see is you'll see the counterterrorism service uh, uh, advancing on one axis, you'll see the federal police advancing on another axis, and you'll see the Iraqi army advancing on a, on a third axis. Uh, each one of them now able to operate inside of a dense urban environment and be able to continue to make gains every single day, make progress every single day uh, against ISIL. And, uh, and, and so it's not like it was uh, back nine months ago uh, where they struggled uh, to, to get a true combined arms maneuver in order to be able to defeat the enemy. And today they're doing that. 
And every day they're getting better at that. Uh, as they continue to gain more experience at this, they gain more confidence. Their leaders great, gain greater competence. Uh, and so they, they, they continue to make progress. And, and it's, it's actually uh, it's very impressive to see. Uh, next we'll go to Michael Gordon of the New York Times. Uh, sir, I was out in around Mosul at the early first few weeks of this uh, operation. It's been reported there's significant attrition that Iraqi forces have uh, suffered, including the CTS. Um, what uh, steps have you taken uh, to help the Iraqi forces deal with this attrition? What adjustments have been made? Has it affected plans, training and equipping plans, replenishment plans for the forces? And what is the end strength for the CTS and ISF in light of these operations? What's the projected end strength you'd like to have? So as we're talking about uh, uh, casualties within the ISF, you know, specific numbers and all, I'm, I'm, I'm sure, uh, as you know, uh, we, we address those to the, to the Iraqi Ministry of Defense. Um, but, but what I will talk about is, uh, is as we are uh, looking at what happened in those early days in the attack in Mosul, uh, uh, like you said, you were there, you saw it. Uh, what we witnessed was we saw, uh, you know, Daesh's, uh, ISIL's primary weapon system was that vehicle-borne IED. Uh, and they used it actually with, uh, with, with pretty good effectiveness. Uh, one out of every two uh, VBIT attacks resulted in, in some, type of, uh, some type of casualty, whether it was uh, uh, vehicles, equipment, uh, you know, or, or personnel. Uh, and what we have done over time, uh, working together, is to be able to bring some of our capabilities uh, and match it with their capabilities. Uh, so within the last couple of weeks, uh, what we've seen is uh, that uh, effectiveness of, of the V-bids go down to uh, one in nine or one in six uh, of their V-bid attacks uh, result in any type of, uh, of damage, and, and that damage is uh, certainly much less uh, than it was before. Uh, and so for both of us, uh, our involvement with them and our partnership with them, uh, it, it has certainly been an, an evolution uh, as we have figured out how to be more effective in our strikes, more effective in the, in the counter-mobility fight in order to be able to su support them uh, against each one of the threats that exist in, in Mosul. You know, as you know, uh, you know, it's a, it's a three-dimensional fight. Uh, they, they're, uh, you know, uh, ISIL is a... Uh, in the basements of buildings, uh, on the roofs of buildings, you know, and, and, uh, and around the corners. And they've uh, had two years to build this defense. Um, but over time, they've gotten much more effective. And uh, it's not just the CTS, it's, it's all the forces that are much more effective uh, there today. And, uh, and they continue to build their own combat power. Uh, and the, the three-axis advance, um, you know, that you see now, uh, and really in particular when it began on December 29th, uh, has taken a lot of pressure off the CTS because in the be beginning there was uh, a lot of the, the brunt of the attack was on the CTS. And so that in and of itself has been a great uh, force protection mechanism for them. Uh, next we'll go to Courtney Cuby of NBC News. I wanted to ask you just one thing from your opening statement. You mentioned that the, the task force uh, has been involved in taking down more than a dozen ISIS drones. Can you give us a, uh, a, a describe what those drones were like, size? I'm assuming that they were unarmed, but what were they? Uh, what was sort of the mission that they were doing, and and how did the task force assist in taking them down? Yeah, the uh, um, you know, the ISIL uh, uh, drones has been something that has evolved over time. It, it, it is a capability uh, that they've had uh, for pretty much the duration of the time that we've been here. It's a, you know, commercial off the shelf, uh, you know, just UAVs that uh, that they purchase. Uh, and in the beginning, uh, they had some of these. Uh, they were a little bit, you know, larger fixed wing, uh, you know, no bigger than a, you know, five foot you know, wingspan, but uh, but some end up and used for reconnaissance. As we've made our way into uh, Mosul now. Uh, what we've seen is that they use the the smaller uh, drones, the you know quadcopters and things, uh, with a much shorter um, ability you know, to to project them out. You know they're up for you know 45 minutes an hour or so, uh, and even that evolution has uh, transitioned in the beginning of the Mosul campaign from 
uh, from just reconnaissance to uh, they are actually putting munitions in them and, uh, and dropping munitions on, uh, on, on the ISF, on the Iraqi security forces uh, in, in their positions. And so while I won't go into uh, any of the uh, technical matters, uh, the technical capabilities that we use uh, on these uh, ISIL drones, what, what we have found is that we're able to bring to bear some of our technical capabilities, uh, and then the Iraqis uh, are able to couple that uh, with much of their direct fire weapons systems and uh, as a result of us working together hand in hand uh, we've been able to to bring down these ISIL drones and uh, and have made them much less effective than they than they were in the beginning Can you give us a little bit, uh, uh, describe a little bit more about the munitions that they've been putting on them and then are you aware that any of these munitions have resulted in the deaths of any Iraqi security forces Yeah, uh, you know, like I said before, um, you know, we, you know, we don't talk about the, uh, you know, the ISF casualties. Uh, uh, that's uh, again something to to take to the Iraqi Ministry of Defense for them to to be able to to address. Uh, I can tell you, it has resulted in the damage to some equipment and, and uh, damage of uh, some structures, uh, as well as to some civilian casualties, because uh, certainly they're not concerned about whether or not any of the civilians in Mosul um, um, are uh, are killed or or wounded. Uh, so, so there has been uh, has been that. Um, you know, they are small drones with uh, uh, with small munitions that they that they've been dropping. Um, you know, just uh, uh, you know, akin to you know a small little grenade uh, that that drops on the ground uh, enough for them to be able to 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 do what uh, what Dash does, and that's just uh, you know indiscriminate killing, uh, and that's uh, that's what they do. But like I said, their effectiveness has significantly waned uh, as we have uh, you know worked to this uh, counter. Uh, UAS fight uh, together with the Iraqis. You haven't seen them trying to deliver any kind of chemicals or any kind of uh, anything like that with these drones, ha or have you? We have not. We have not. No. Next to Barbara Starr from CNN. Colonel, thank you for doing this. I wanted to follow up a bit on what Courtney just asked you. Um, just so I understand, you're saying that ISIS has now achieved the ability to aerial drop the munitions from the wings of these UAVs, and do the UAVs go down on the ground and then sometimes Iraqis may approach them and they explode at that point? Is it both cases? Um, or have they, what, con I mean, it sounds fairly concerning that they would have achieved this capability to drop this stuff off the wings. And also, have any of your U.S. troops been wounded uh, either by this or in any other circumstances? Yeah. Um, so it is a, uh, I, I do want to make sure that we capture uh, a little bit more accurately kind of what it is that we're, we're talking about with regard to these armed uh, UASs. Um, I'm not sure if you're familiar with, uh, with, with these small quadcopters, you know, uh, probably, you know, no bigger than, you know, a, a couple feet in, in diameter. Um, so, uh, so it's not as if it is a, you know, a large uh, armed UAV that's dropping uh, munitions from from the wings, as uh, as you described, uh, but literally a very small uh, quadcopter uh, that that uh, you know drops a you know small munition in a in, in a somewhat imprecise manner, uh, in in a somewhat crude manner, uh, out there on the battlefield, and that's really what what we've seen uh, up to this point, and um, you know like I said you know indiscriminately targeting, uh, going after Iraqi security forces. Uh, we, uh, you know, we certainly, you know, uh, to, to address your question, you know, there have been uh, no U.S. Uh, no U.S. casualties from uh, any of these UASs. They're very short range uh, targeting those frontline troops uh, from the Iraqis. Any casualties in the time you've been there? I'm sorry, I didn't. Uh, I didn't hear that. Could you say that again? Sir, can you just uh, bring us up to date? Has your unit 
suffered any wounded during your deployment? No, we have had no uh, combat-related uh, injuries, no combat-related deaths uh, within Task Force Strike. Um, you know, our, our advisory role uh, as, uh, as, as we partner, so like I talked about with, uh, you know, Captain Fitzgerald in, the, in the, my opening statement, you know, Captain Fitzgerald, you know, his partner is, uh, is an Iraqi two-star general. Uh, the lowest that we go is, uh, you know, one-star generals uh, who we are uh, partnering with. Uh, so it's one, two, three-star generals. And, and much like you would imagine, you know, they are behind the lines. They're in their, you know, their command posts, in their headquarters. Uh, and that's where we do our advising. You know, we are there to, to assist them with uh, situational awareness tools. We're there to help bring precision fires in support of their operations. And our effectiveness comes from being co-located uh, with their decision makers, their general officers. And so, uh, uh, so as you can imagine, you know, their general officers are not on the front lines, you know, kicking down doors and, and, uh, and shooting people. Uh, and, uh, and that's where our advisors are. That's where they're best placed uh, is with those, uh, those Iraqi uh, commanders uh, behind the front lines, you know, in those headquarters areas. I was noticing, though, I guess what I was referring to in your fact sheet, you said your fire battalion has fired more than 6,000 rounds, the highest number of PGMs ever fired in combat. Oh, since you say ever fired in combat, um, over what period of time are you talking about? In, since you were there? 6,000 rounds since you arrived? That's right. That's right. Yes. Um, so, uh, y y I'm sure you all remember, uh, you know, Firebase Bell uh, that was there at the, you know, uh, more than a few months ago. Uh, we fell in immediately on that. Uh, my task force top guns uh, came in, assumed that position, and uh, and from the beginning, we've been providing uh, precision surface to surface all weather fires uh, in support of uh, Iraqi security force maneuver uh, that's been part of our uh, uh, part of our assistance effort uh, to them and so you know like we talked about uh, um, you know us bringing you know strikes forward uh, a lot of times people think of that as uh, just primarily uh, the the close air support you know the you know the air force aircraft that are that are flying overhead um, but there's also an all-weather you know component uh, we've got you know high mars triple uh, seven uh, artillery we've got uh, paladins uh, all that have been in support of the iraqi security force maneuver uh, and it is something that we work in concert with our iraqi counterparts in the beginning, when I first got here, and I talked about Karbdan, we did, you know, Karbdan, Karbat Jabber, Hajali, you know, a series of villages that, that we went on through. And my partner, every time that he would want fire support, he would turn to us and say, you know, can you provide us uh, fire support? And I said, well, you know, you've got uh, your own artillery. Uh, but in the beginning, as we talk about the maturation of the security forces, in the beginning, uh, they didn't have any trust or confidence in their artillery forces. And that's something that when we talk about our advisory mission, uh, we've gone forward w uh, to, to co-locate with their artillery in order to be able to provide some additional training and instruction in order to increase the, the precision of their own fires. Uh, so now, uh, as we are in, in Mosul, uh, there is a, a whole range of, uh, of kinetic strikes that could be brought, some of which are Iraqi and some of which are our coalition. And we've been there in order to support. Uh, clearly, we have a, a great precision fires capability, whether it's air delivered or whether it's surface to surface. Uh, and so when we talk about the precision fires that have been delivered, the greatest number in, you know, in combat ever, uh, that's because of new precision fires capability that, that has come to even our own army and our ability to, to deliver very accurate uh, fires, uh, which is particularly important as we're fighting in an urban area in order to be able to, to go through the very deliberate process to, to limit uh, any collateral damage. Rounds of ground fire, on average, what would you say, out of 6,000 rounds, and it's the highest ever, how many ground combat rounds a day do you fire?
Um, I, I only caught the, the last portion of, uh, of your question there. Um, so you, you were asking, you know, how, what percentage of these are, uh, are, are precision uh, fires? Is that, is that your question? Sir, sorry. I'm just asking, you say you're firing 6,000 rounds in combat, according to your fact sheet. So if it's 6,000 rounds, on average, give me your best calculation. What would you say you fire? And maybe it was more in the beginning. What would you say, how many rounds on average a day in this ground combat that you describe? Yeah, I, I'm not prepared to, to, to tell you, I guess, what the daily average is on the, on the rounds that are fired. Um, I will say that uh, uh, we are, you know, firing more today uh, than we were six months ago. Uh, today, as we are supporting, uh, you know, multiple axes uh, in, in their maneuver as they are, you know, maneuvering in and around uh, Mosul, uh, certainly, you know, we are firing more today than, you know, six months ago when we were just uh, supporting, you know, the, the maneuver of one division uh, taking, you know, one village uh, at a time. And so, uh, so we are. We, you know, we are there uh, supporting uh, as part of a whole range of, uh, of kinetic strike capability, precision fires capability uh, that we provide to the Iraqis uh, every single day. Uh, next to David Martin from CBS News. You said you had uh, reduced the effectiveness of uh, vehicle-borne uh, <clears throat> IEDs from one and two that caused damage to and you said one in nine or one in six, so just one to clarify, is it one in nine or is it one in six? And besides uh, dropping the bridge spans uh, across uh, the Tigris, what else have you done to reduce the effectiveness of V-bits? Yeah, I, I think this is a, uh uh, this is a great news story uh, in terms of our advisory effort and, and really working together with the Iraqis on this one. Um, so as you know, as you know, um, you know the the V bids uh, have a uh, have a tremendous impact, uh, not only in terms of casualties, uh, but they've got a great psychological impact uh, when you've got an explosion of of that size that that go off in, in proximity to to soldiers uh, of any kind. Uh, and so really getting after the 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 V bid fight has been an important one for us. And so what we have been working together with our Iraqi counterparts are uh, a whole range of things in order to be able to, to be more effective. Uh, one of them is just uh, increasing the number of uh, anti-tank uh, munitions that our Iraqi counterparts have. Uh, there's a, an equipping program that, uh, that we do uh, that, that has allowed us to, to increase the numbers of these munitions in the hands of the Iraqis that, that are there on the front lines. Uh, the second thing is uh, working through uh, even some very uh, rudimentary uh, um, methods like uh, road spikes or uh, you know, hedgehogs, uh, you know, string and wire you know, out uh, along the roads. Uh, there's a there's a natural pace of operations that occurs each day, uh, where uh, you know you attack and uh, you know at some point you gotta you know kind of uh, establish a defensive line and and then prepare for the next day. Uh, but now you know when they when they uh, slow that advance and decide this is the point that we're going to stop and you know uh, um, you know kind of refit until we push on again. They they put out uh, these counter mobility measures uh, put these things out there on the ground uh, as we've seen you know uh, these v bids come in uh, any form of a sedan or truck or anything and, and some of these elementary methods uh, help to be able to to stop their advance or slow their advance uh, to the point where they can be targeted and the other thing that we do is uh, you know we do some uh, we do some terrain denial uh, there are uh, at times some, uh, you know, some high-speed avenues of approach that are that are difficult to, to put some of these road spikes in, and and so uh, so we'll we'll put some uh, some some craters in the roads, very large potholes uh, that a uh, that a vehicle would have to slow down or would have to maneuver around or or potentially even you know if it's a heavily laden vehicle would get stuck uh, inside these areas, and so then the ISF are able to then uh, engage them. 
uh, much more quickly. Uh, the reason why I said one to nine and, and, and one to six uh, is because uh, you know, we do it on kind of a, you know, a two week average. And uh, over the course of the last month, it was one to nine, and then, uh, and then you know, we've had uh, one to six uh, lately. Uh, some of that's just uh, dependent on how fluid the battlefield is. And uh, so sometimes that percentage changed. But regardless, uh, you know, going from 50% to, to these uh, larger percentages has been uh, a, significant, uh, a significant win for us. And, and at the same time, even the ones that do have some effectiveness, uh, the relative effectiveness has been less in terms of the, you know, the number of casualties or the, the amount of equipment uh, that's been damaged. Uh, next to Bill Hennigan with the Los Angeles Times. Hey, Colonel. Um, these uh, dozen drones that you mentioned before, <coughs> when did you first start seeing this, um, uh, when did you first start taking them down and when did they first have the capability of, of dropping munitions? Well, um, so like I said, when, you know, even after we first got here, uh, this is a capability that uh, that ISIL has had uh, to to be able to fly drones. Hey, you know, it's a it's the same ability that uh, you know any you know 13 year old kid in the states has. Uh, you know, he can get online and and, and purchase a, you know some type of uh, unmanned aerial vehicle and, and put it up. And so uh, that's what Dash has been doing. ISIL has been doing uh, for some time. Uh, and even in the beginning when we were first here, sometimes these things would fly over and uh, our counterparts would, you know, through small arms, uh, they, would, they would shoot them down and uh, bring them down. So, uh, so they've been, uh, you know, they've been coming down for a little while, but uh, uh, it wasn't until that uh, we got closer and closer to Mosul uh, that, we, that we really began to see uh, not only the, the increase in quantity, uh, but the frequency of their flights. Uh, and, then, uh, and then really that's when we saw them uh, using them uh, in an armed fashion in order to be able to drop them on our, uh, on our Iraqi counterparts on their, on their front lines. And so that has been something that has evolved. Uh, you know, it was, uh, you know, it's almost like popcorn, right? You, you know, you, you, know you, you see one and then you don't see another one for a little while and then you see another one and then you see another one and, and so actually it's, uh, it has increased in frequency. Uh, or it did increase in frequency, I guess I should say, uh, until very recently, uh, both as we have now uh, been in, more engaged uh, with our partners and helping out with this fight. Uh, and so now we've seen that, uh, we've seen their use drop off. And, and at the same time, as the Iraqis have taken more ground uh, inside of uh, Mosul, uh, most recently uh, elements of the federal police moved into an area uh, and captured up um, uh, what appeared to be uh, kind of a, a UAV uh, launch and recovery site uh, where they collected up a bunch of UAV parts that uh, when ISIL was in such a hurry to depart the area, uh, they left all these, uh, all these things there. Uh, and so, uh, so obviously their, their effectiveness and, and the quantities available to them have certainly decreased over time. Number one is they've been you know, shot out of the sky, brought down, or, uh, or as the, these areas have been taken over. Thanks. And um, as you approach the Tigris here, what challenges do you see going west as you push into the, 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 the districts west of the, the river? Yeah. Um, so, uh, so I'm sure you've heard, uh, I think it was in an Iraqi press release yesterday, uh, they believe there's somewhere between 70 and 80 percent uh, complete uh, with eastern Mosul and, um, and, and really uh, in terms of the kind of the doctrinal definition of defeat, you know, you can say that, uh, that, that there has been a defeat there uh, because they have certainly broken their will to fight, uh, uh, to continue to, to really fight in earnest. Uh, in eastern Mosul, and so uh, so the Iraqi security forces continue to make great progress there, uh, and so um, you know naturally the fight's not over. Uh, there is uh, there, there's a lot of fight uh, that's left to do in western Mosul. There has been uh, an extensive uh, defensive work that has been done in western Mosul. Uh, they have certainly been working on that area, uh, and in even uh, some cases have greater defenses built in western Mosul than they did in eastern Mosul. And uh, I think you've seen recently they, uh, uh, they completed the, uh, not the complete destruction, but have certainly uh, even uh, done more destruction to a couple of the bridges lately to ensure that uh, they, they could try to delay the advance 
of the Iraqi security forces uh, over to the uh, over to the west side. Uh, but I'll tell you that um, you know. You know, the Iraqi security forces, as I said, they have a tremendous capability. Uh, that capability has grown. Uh, they've gotten better at this uh, urban fight. Uh, they know what they're getting themselves into. Uh, and they know that they have, uh, in many cases, uh, you know, broken the will uh, of, uh, of many of these Daesh fighters. And uh, we hear a lot more and more about, uh, about many of them, uh, you know, running away. And, uh, and certainly when ISIL hears uh, that they've got fighters running away, they, you know, they execute them. Uh, so I don't know what incentive that gives to people to, to continue to, to fight for them. Um, but, uh, but certainly that's uh, just another indication of, you know, how they operate. Uh, but, uh, you know, the uh, ISF have, uh, have more than enough capability to get around to the west side and, and to begin that fight. Uh, they, uh, they certainly don't need uh, those bridges in order to be able to, to get over there. Uh, they've demonstrated in the past uh, that they can they can build bridges. Um, you know, uh, like I talked about earlier, um, you know, we have provided advising uh, at, at multiple echelons. Well, one of the things that we've done is uh, bridge advising. Uh, and so when they first put in that first bridge over the Tigris, uh, we were there to advise them and provide some, you know, technical capabilities in, in putting that bridge in. And then they put a second bridge in, and we were there to advise them on that second bridge. Uh, but then uh, they put in a third and, and a fourth bridge uh, without us there, uh, without us advising. Uh, they've, uh, they've grown in their capability to do these things, and I'm confident uh, that they'll be able to continue to do that as they bring forces uh, from the east side to the west side when they're ready to do that. Okay, uh, next to Corey Dickstein, Stars and Stripes. Hey, sir. Appreciate you doing this. Um, I wanted to see. You said uh, obviously that the vehicle-borne IEDs um, have been less effective recently. Do you have um, maybe an estimate of how often they're using them? I'm sure it's daily, but but can you say how often the ISF is uh, coming into contact with them? And, and are they becoming more crude uh, as territory is taken and things are, are cleared? Um, that they've held for a while. Yeah, t today I, I, to be honest with you, I, I read an article uh, today. Um, uh, Major General Mann, uh, who is uh, one of the commanders of the counterterrorism service, uh, I think he, he said it best. He said, in the beginning, uh, we would see as many as uh, 10 V bids a day uh, against our frontline troops. Uh, and today, uh, you know, we see, you know, no more than, than one or two. And on some days, we, you know, we don't see any. Uh, and, and you're right. They have become much more crude. Uh, when we were fighting on the outskirts of Mosul, before we even got into, into the city proper, uh, you know, we like to call them those uh, Mad Max-looking uh, V-bids. They had uh, taken vehicles. They had uh, put steel plating, you know, all around these things and uh, just had a, you know, small little porthole that the, that the driver would be able to see through. Uh, and they would try to, you know, ram these things into, uh, into the Iraqi defenses. Uh, and today, you know, we don't, we don't see those anymore. Uh, like you said, they are uh, much more uh, crude. Um, uh, to some degree, that's, uh, that's good uh, because they have less capability to break through barriers. Uh, in some cases, uh, it, it does make it even a little bit more difficult uh, because they look like every other sedan that's on the street. And so, uh, so sometimes it can be difficult in the targeting because the Iraqi security forces have, have shown great restraint and great care in being able to safeguard not only the, the people of Mosul, the civilians, uh, that are still there in Mosul, uh, but even their property. And so that has, uh, in some cases, even made it just a little bit more difficult on them. Um, and then uh, on the artillery, uh, you said uh, your artillery battalion has worked directly with the, the Iraqi artillery forces. Um, can you talk at all to how uh, the Iraqi artillery has advanced? Um, are they able to strike with you know, similar precision to, to, our, to, uh, to our artillery soldiers. Um, and then can you kind of also tell, you know, how precise, you know, can a Paladin or a 777 get? Can you take out uh, a VBI IED, you know, with, a, with an artillery strike like that? Uh, 
Uh, so first off, I'm not going to go into the, the, the specifics, as you could imagine, on exactly how precise, uh, you know, our artillery is, uh, given, you know, some of the specifications on the, you know, the rounds and things that we have. Um, but what I will say is that uh, they have been able to, to strike V-bids. Uh, they have been able to, uh, to take out a, you know, a mortar team, uh, which is, you know, two guys standing around, a, you know, a, a mortar tube. And been able to, you know, to strike them uh, with with great precision. Uh, they have, uh, you know, they've been able to, you know, to put rounds uh, in uh, in some in some places that have allowed us to to destroy dash uh, and and at the same time safeguard, uh, you know, structures uh, or even you know civilians that that may have been, um, you know, uh, close, uh, not too close, but uh, but but close. Uh, can the Iraqis do that? They don't have the same. The same type of equipment. While they do have some paladins, they have an earlier version of paladins. Uh, they don't have the same kind of rounds and things that that, that we do, um, but they have become much more precise in terms of what they've been able to do. Uh, they, uh, they 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 don't necessarily have the same precision that uh, that we do, though. Okay. Next, we'll go to Kasim Eleri with Anadolu News Agency. Uh, sir, thanks for doing this. Uh, during your operations around Mosul, have you um, had any interaction with the forces trained by Turkey in Bashika? Uh, yes, I have. Um, so there are um, some tribal, uh, Sunni tribal fighters. Uh, that were trained uh, in Bashika, and they are um, currently fully integrated in with the Iraqi Army and uh, with the 16th Iraqi Army Division uh, on the northern axis. Uh, they have been used as a uh, as a hold force. So after the 16th Iraqi Army Division has pushed through certain areas, has cleared those areas of of, of ISIL, uh, they were able to to move some of these tribal fighters in. Uh, to hold that ground uh, to, to prevent any, you know, uh, infiltration of, uh, of ISIL uh, behind them. Uh, and so I have had, uh, had, had that limited uh, interaction with them uh, only through uh, the 16th Division. What was your in, uh, impression about their capabilities? Uh, are, they, are they trained well? They, they've proven uh, that they were able to, to hold that ground uh, behind the uh, Iraqi army. Um, certainly, I'm getting my information uh, secondhand from the commander of the 16th Iraqi Army Division, and, uh, and they are you know, fully integrated. Uh, those, uh, th those tribal fighters are not there by themselves. They're there with uh, the Iraqi army uh, soldiers uh, who, who really do kind of provide the, you know, kind of the overall uh, backbone uh, for the, the security forces uh, in that area. Uh, so that's really the only uh, assessment that I could, I can provide on them. Uh, and finally, uh, to Louis Martinez from ABC News. Hi, Colonel. Uh, thanks for joining this briefing. Um, I want to ask you about the federal police. Um, how are they being utilized in the fight in Mosul? Are they a holding force now? Are they being used as a combat force? Uh, how many of them are there? What's your role in advising them uh, in, as they oper operate in Mosul? Yeah, the, first of all, I'll say the you know the federal police has has proven to be uh, a critical uh, portion of the overall Iraqi security forces that are that are engaged in this fight. And if I could just step back just a little bit and, and frame, you know, what we're talking about when we talk about uh, the police. I know some of you all, you know, are aware of this, but I just want to make sure that we, you know, kind of frame it appropriately. You know, we have uh, local police uh, who are those who, you know, grow up in that area, uh, you know, work for the Ministry of Interior, and they are, uh, if you will, cops on the beat. Uh, we have uh, Nineveh Provincial Police. Uh, who are kind of a, you know, a little bit of a, a step above. Uh, uh, they're not tied to, you know, kind of a checkpoint on the street or anything. They're the ones that are able to, to move around and, uh, and, and, and more along the lines of, you know, if you will, in the United States, uh, you know, kind of the, the, the state troopers uh, who, who have some mobility there. And then you've got the federal police. 
uh, who uh, are trained by the Italian Carabinieri. You know, they're a gendarmerie. You know, they are, um, you know, really a, a high-end uh, force who, who has the capability for uh, offensive maneuver. Uh, they have uh, they have vehicles and equipment and weapon systems uh, that uh, that make them much more than police and and really kind of uh, straddle the line. Uh, you know they're they're more like a, a an army unit uh, with uh, policing authorities, and so the federal police and uh, and and you know kind of a little partnership uh, with the uh, emergency response division who is uh, currently falling under the federal police. Uh, they have proven to be. Uh, a very effective fighting force. Uh, I know that uh, in the past they, they served perhaps a little bit different role in places like uh, Fallujah, uh, but here uh, they have, uh, uh, this is the first time that, that we have advised them and, uh, and, and it has been a, a really a fruitful uh, partnership uh, in, uh, in all regards. And so as a result what we have seen and, and I talked about uh, you know that day in the church where we had all of the the Iraqi security forces together, uh, when I think about the greatest achievement or the greatest accomplishment uh, of my time here has been the integration of each one of these Iraqi security forces. And so today, uh, you'll see that the, you know, the CTS, the counterterrorism services, have uh, given forces up to the Iraqi army, to the northern axis, in order to be able to, to facilitate you know, their clearance. Uh, you've got, uh, you know, fed pole forces and counterterrorism services that, that meet each day in order to be able to synchronize and coordinate uh, maneuvers as they are in support of one another and their, and their clearance operations. Uh, something that, that I don't think we've ever seen before, uh, that degree of, of synchronization and uh, cooperation amongst these Iraqi security forces. And, and I'm very proud to say that Task Force Strike and our advisors and our advisor teams, company commanders, battalion commanders, uh, they've been there with each one of these elements facilitating this crosstalk and this coordination and this synchronization. And over time, I, um, I'd like to say that, you know, that we played a role uh, in being able to bring each one of them together. And so the rapid gains that we've seen since 29 December uh, in my opinion, are a direct result of uh, all of them working together in synchronization uh, to be able to achieve the effects and, and the, the, the great success uh, of the last couple of weeks. If I could follow on real quick. Um, around that time frame, the 29th of December, I guess there was discussion of a second phase going inside Mosul. Uh, there was talk about the federal police's role in, uh, in, as part of that operation. Were they always a part of the operation or were they brought in as an add-on um, because of uh, the, the situation, the holding situation that had taken place in Mosul at that time. Yeah, so the, the federal police have always been part of this, uh, you know, Mosul counteroffensive. On the 17th of October, uh, the federal police were, you know, they owned uh, one of the axes of advance. Uh, and, uh, and, and liberated, you know, uh, almost uh, 56 kilometers of, uh, of what we used to call, you know, MSR Tampa, uh, between MSR Tampa and, and the Tigris River. Um, a, a very impressive uh, move, uh, multiple villages, uh, you, know, uh, you know, we count villages a little bit different, but I think if you ask them, they'll tell you they liberated, you know, almost 100 villages, you know, through that, that particular area. Uh, and then they achieved, you know, what it was that uh, they were initially asked to do. They, they met their limit of advance. They were there to, uh, to set up some blocking positions and, and to, and to uh, support uh, from that side. And then, uh, and so, you know, like you talked about, yeah, we, we did go to a phase two on December 29th, and there was a reorganization of the, of the combat power. And so then the federal police then uh, uh, did bring forces from the west side of the Tigris over to the east side of the Tigris in order to be able to, to add combat power to, to the fight there uh, on the east, uh, as we had seen you know, ISIL uh, move in combat power from the west to the east as well. And so, uh, so that addition of combat power, the development of a, of a refined plan, the, and the ability to, to move forward in order to be able to, to make the rapid gains that we see today. And uh, with that, we will uh, call it a day. Uh, Colonel Sylvia, thank you very much for your time and uh, for coming uh, to Baghdad to do this. And uh, we wish you all the best of luck in the fight to retake Mosul and look forward to seeing you again soon.
It's been my pleasure. Thank you.